King. Welcome to First Star Logistics in the Trenches with Dave Lapham, special guest today. And I do mean special. And I'm talking about the most interesting man in the world. And he was the original most interesting man in the world. None other than Pat McAnally. And uh, Pat, Paul Brown always used to say that football is just a, the initial phase of your life, men. It's a, it's a transition to what you're going to do for the rest of your life. And he always appreciated guys that were successful after their football career. If Paul Brown was still alive, he'd be extremely proud of you, my man. Uh, thank you. So what, what is it about your mind? Pat McAnally, Harvard grad. I mean, he, when you wake up in the morning, are you always trying to think of the next thing? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm really lucky because, uh, you know, I've been married a long time to Leslie and uh, her is a very inquiring mind also. So, yeah, we get up, we think about what we could do, and, of course, 99% of them get eliminated. But it's always fun to explore, um, particularly, you know, lately out here in California with this coronavirus. They just now announced literally today that they're going to allow, like, some form of football in some counties. Hmm. But this has been the longest, uh, most challenging year. But for me, it just gave us more opportunity to convince kids that uh, they should get their grades and, and give themselves an opportunity to play. You know, at a, I'm not so into Division One schools. I, I, you know, Stanford's great, obviously, in those Ivy League schools. But we have some great Division Three schools where you can be five foot four and still play. And I, I love working with those kids. Well, in 2017, you founded College Sports Connections, a company dedicated to helping high school scholar-athletes find a college best suited to their talents and ambitions. In 2018, you founded the Play College Now Foundation, nonprofit to organization helping students, student-athletes from uh, economically challenged families, and uh, you helped them prepare for ACT, SAT, concussion baseline testing protocol. I mean, you're doing some great stuff. Is, is that your primary passion right now? Yeah, it really is. <clears throat> you know, I, it goes back to uh, when I, I think it was my second or third year with the Bengals. You know, I'd come out here the day after the season ended <clears throat> and uh, for the uh, weather. And uh, I, I met a kid. God, I mean, it's scary because he was still in high school. You know, I don't know what they'd accuse me of nowadays. But I started working out with this, this kid, Mike Jacobs. He was a just going to go into his senior year of, uh, of high school and his parents had had a divorce and he uh, was going to this Canyon high school. And so we started working out and he was living with my, one of my dad's friends. And so he was going through a really tough, tough time, but we were playing all kinds of sports and uh, he took the SATs like three times and got, are you ready Dave? 395 on his math, right? Mm -hmm. Mm. Couldn't couldn't up it, and but I love this kid. He was just a great, great athlete and a great kid. Well, I flew back to the president of Harvard, Derek Bach, and met with him, and I said, "You got to take this kid. <laughs> Believe me, you got to take him." And yet they did at three ninety five to Harvard. Well, wow. yeah, I made all Ivy League. He was six three, like two twenty. Made all Ivy League two years of safety, but more importantly, has five medical degrees. Wow. He, he was the chief medical officer on the USS Abraham Lincoln um, aircraft carrier. Jeez. Uh, but, but he is so, I can't tell you how indebted he still is. I just gave him the opportunity. I mean, he's the one that took advantage of it. But we're still really close friends, and that's what inspired me all, all those years ago. And now I've got um, even more time to do it. And that's why I coach this small, uh, you know, small Christian school out here, uh, Calvary Chapel, so that I, I help kids. I don't care if they're on our team or the other. If we play somebody that's good and they can play at Claremont McKenna or Pitzer or Chapman or one of those really good schools, um, and they're, I don't care if they're five six and 160 pounds, but if they can play and they got the grades and the scores, I help them, and it's really fun. That's 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 unbelievable. Let, let's uh, let's go back to your your athletic career. I mean, you were a great football player, obviously at the, at Harvard. Um, you won the the George Bulger Low Award in, in, from the Gridiron Club of Boston. I know all about that. That's for the New England Player of the Year. You won that in 1974. 
in 73, second in the nation, setting a Harvard record, 56 catches in a single season back in 1973. A hell of a football player, you know, obviously punter, punter as well. But what, what other sports? I mean, didn't Wooden offer you a basketball scholarship at UCLA out of high school? Yeah, I was actually got a lot more scholarship offers in in basketball than football. I really wasn't very good in high school, other than kicking. I really wasn't. I was okay. I was playing quarterback, but I should have been a receiver. So uh, it was frustrating. I, I can tell you, I got sick of people continuing telling me that I, uh, you know, had great potential. I wanted to get some acknowledgement. You know, I wanted to get some success. Right. But uh, and I went and visited. Actually, went and visited Harvard. We paid our own dime, you know, went and visited uh, just to get away, you know, for, and well, you remember this, it's a big deal, you know, the letter. So I was going to have to make a decision and schools right. were making me pick one or the other. Yep. But I went back there just to hide and fell in love with the place. And it was icy, terrible weather, you know, icy, raining and just terrible, but I just fell in love with it. And I felt like they didn't own me. You know, I didn't want to, I just was nervous about a scholarship and being confined. And that wasn't the case at Harvard. Right. You should have been my teammate, you know. I mean, <laughs> laugh. Come on now. <laughs> oh, I know, man. That, that would have been a blast. Was a dominant, man. <laughs> that would have been a blast. But So Wooden offers you at UCLA. And, and how did that go when, when you said no? I mean, what was that like saying no to John Wooden? Well, I really was more heavily recruited by Tommy Prothrow. Okay. Uh, I, yep. Again, I had to pick one of the two. Okay. By the way, you know, Prothrow was like 6'8". You know, he was bigger than any player he ever had at UCLA. <laughs> wow. Yeah, he, you know, he never cashed a check. He had his own. He was an amazing guy. Huh. Um, but, you know, I, I have to tell you this story, I, you know. So when I was at the college all-star game, you know, which can you imagine – we were playing the world champion Pittsburgh Steelers, right? Remember yep. that game? Oh, yeah. yeah. So, uh, and, and uh, John McKay from USC was the, the coach. Yep. And so he and he had a great, his son, J.K. McKay, was really a great receiver. Yep. Still has a bunch of high school records out here uh, in California. Uh, anyway, so McKay corners me in uh, the elevator uh, after a practice and one day and, and uh, he says, well, McAnally, how come you didn't come to USC? You know, we were recruiting you. We wanted you. And I looked at him and I said, you know, coach, I want to be serious here for just a second. Both of my parents, not just one, both of them insisted I go to a fully accredited university. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Because he had the biggest ego, seriously. Oh, yeah. In the world. And, uh, yeah. But he still had the guts to start me, <laughs> so he forgave me, I guess. <laughs> Man, and, and unfortunately, you ended up breaking your leg scoring a touchdown in that all-star game against the Pittsburgh Steelers, and you miss your uh, first year. You get drafted by the Bengals in 75 and have to miss that season because of that injury, right? Yeah, that was the most fortuitous thing that could have happened to me. I mean, think about the receivers we had. Charlie Joyner, Chip Myers, Isaac John Curtis. McDaniels. They were just investing in Isaac, of course. Right. So I, and they had Dave Green punning, you know, they were right. not unhappy with him yet, you know, when they had him do both jobs, remember the next year. Sure. Or my rookie year. So I don't know how I make the team that year, honestly. I've always thought that. But then the next year, you know, Chip Myers retired and they traded Charlie Joyner away and suddenly there were some, and they weren't that happy with Dave Green. So there it was. It's amazing how life works. Huh? It is unbelievable. Now I remember. Do you remember when we would sit? Because I was we was only be your room because you had an air conditioner. Yes, I. So had a, we would I, I, we I go over who was going to make the team. Remember that? Oh yeah, we go through the yeah. roster uh, a million different ways. Yeah, we, yeah. We'd uh, we'd have our own our own cut down uh, nights. You know. Uh, yeah, I had, yeah. That, I had that that window unit, that window air conditioner, man. That that, <laughs> oh. that dog would hunt right there. That dog would oh, that was the key, man. No I'd question. sleep on that floor happily. <laughs> <laughs> no question. Well, it, what about your beach volleyball exploits? I mean, that's you, you dominated out in the West Coast in beach volleyball, didn't you? Well, until I got to you know Karch Karai and Sinjin Smith, but yeah. no, yeah, I was playing the opens there and. Uh, get to the quarterfinals and then play great and lose like 11 
two eleven one. <laughs> Those guys are great. But yeah, it was and it was a great conditioner for me. I loved it. It's plus they were the greatest fans of all time. <clears throat> a lot of talent there. So you uh you played with the Bengals in, in nineteen eighty one, first graduate from Harvard to ever ever play in either the Pro Bowl or the Super Bowl. And you did both in that nineteen eighty one season. We go to the Super Bowl and, and you go to the uh, the Pro Bowl. That's that's got to be something you got to be proud of. First Harvard grad to ever do anything like that. Yeah, that, that was really tough. You can remember those years because um, the players voted, and I couldn't get it. I, I beat Ray Guy one year by you know like a yard and a half, but yep. I still didn't make the Pro Bowl. Yep. Uh, he, you know, and he was great. Granted, and you know, remember Oakland never lost a game. I, what they win like. 20 straight Monday night games, and they were amazing during that period. They were. And, and he was worthy of it. He was fantastic talent. But it was uh, good for punters, but not not good for me. And so they finally, yeah, we finally had just a superior season. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I got to go. That was that was pretty wild. And, and you know, we when we went, so Shula was the coach. <clears throat> and we had played Baltimore earlier. Um that year, remember we played him there. It was a really good game. Oh no, um, I think yeah, we played him early in the year. Bert and Jones, his friend, yep. Dave, yeah, Dave Shula. I think that was the one, right? He played special teams for one year. Yep. So he comes up and he's like, you know, trying to hit me after I punted. You know, like like a little chicken blocking. <laughs> I picked him up and threw him on his head. Seriously. I'm very proud that I that I got four personal fouls <laughs> as a kicker. That's a record for sure. <laughs> but, but anyway, I threw Shula on his head. And the first thing, as soon as we arrive in Hawaii, Shula corners me, Don, yeah. and says, why would you do that to my son? And why you pick him up and throw him on his head? Because of that, you have to play receiver all week. <laughs> I'm going to make you not just punt. You have to go run pattern. Uh, and then uh, then you'll appreciate this. So <clears throat> we played Pittsburgh uh, at home, and it was icy, really bad field. And I had a, a play. They put me in at a tight end, and I was supposed to bump off uh, off Lambert and just pivot to the outside, you know, mm-hmm. just like a fake block and then right. go to like a little three-yard pattern, which I did and uh, caught the ball. But didn't score. I got to the one inch line, but bad mark, by the way. Right. But anyway, <laughs> so I hit Lambert, barely touched him, and he goes flying. He hit a patch of ice. <laughs> it looked like I absolutely hammered him. So I swear to you. So, how many months later is it we're in the Pro Bowl, and Lambert makes me stay after practice for a half hour? and run patterns with him one-on-one and beat the hell out of him. Oh, man. <laughs> for, like, for like 30 minutes. He carried that girl. <laughs> you didn't hit me. That was the That oh, was amazing. That classic. was Lambert. That's classic. <laughs> you know, the other thing that you're you're known for, obviously, is uh, that intelligence. and The only verified perfect score amongst NFL players with the Wonderlick test. And, uh, you know, that's the aptitude for adapting to situations and overall raw intelligence. And you get a perfect 50 on that bad boy. And then you take it again in 2007, you were managing uh, marketing of the, of the Wonderlick exam and, and you missed one. And then you said, not bad after six concussions, <laughs> only missed one. So what, 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 what was it about Wonderlick that you just found so easy, man? I don't, you know, my dad is always, he was always convinced that it was some rich Harvard guy that owned a team that made it up. But actually the Wonderlick uh, family actually told me, showed me that I, I really did good. I have no idea because there's nothing else I've ever scored perfect on in anything. I have no idea. And yeah, to take it the second time and get a 49 was, that that actually shocked me. So I don't know, do you take all the tests um you know, for the concussion protocols, you know, for the NFL, no. you know that you didn't ever, you didn't apply for the money that we were supposed to get that they've never given out. No, uh, no, oh, I, didn't. I, missed. I didn't. Oh, it was brutal, man. I took this test and the guy said, he honestly, the guy administering said, are you trying? <laughs> I missed so many. Really? And wow. I really was trying. Yeah. You know, they were, 
So anyway, so they didn't award, you know, award me anything, which was fine. And I'm like, my wife said, you know, it's good to have my brain, you know, I'm glad that I, that I you know, wasn't qualified, but I don't know. That's what I try. I actually tried to pull it on Dave. I said, look, yeah, um, I'm still scoring a, very high, you know, compared to other people. But I started with a 50. <laughs> right, you started so perfect. Really, <laughs> so I'm down to like a 20-something now. I should get, I should be rewarded because I started higher. But anyway, they didn't go for it. <laughs> Man, unbelievable. Well, that, that hit you took uh, in the Cleveland game against with Tom Darden, I mean, I can understand that, that, that was a, unbelievable. I mean, you were knocked out cold. And uh, and for you to come back into the football game like you did, not just punt, but then to catch a touchdown pass, that's one of the – Forrest Gregg, who's a ultimate tough guy, you you, yeah. you got so much respect for what what you did in that football game. I, I think Forrest Gregg was even dumbfounded. Take us through what was going through your mind, what you can remember about what was going through <laughs> your mind in that game against Cleveland uh, in 1980. It was the last game of the season in Cincinnati we're playing the Browns. Dave Lapham here, and every day I am grateful for my experience to have played professional football. As a player, I realize self-motivation, leadership, and appreciating your teammates are key. At First Star Logistics, you can use those same attributes to create the life you want for you and your family. Build your future by working hard like I did. You'll see results both on and off the field. Call First Star Logistics today and be part of our winning team. Opportunity knocking. Yeah, before we went to the Super Bowl, yep. Trump always said that that started the momentum going for us, which yep. is, I don't know if that's true, but it was great. The truth of the matter is my contract was up. And you know how Kenny would always throw me 15 passes a year when my contracts were up? <laughs> right. Cool as that. But anyway, so I needed some catches. And um, so when I got knocked out, you know, it was my fault for running into Darden's two forearms to my head. That was my fault. I, I shouldn't have, you know, thrown my head into his forearm. Right. <laughs> and I remember, I mean, I, and I remember, um, you know, I was out like 20 minutes and they went, I went underneath the guy at the exam. And so then I thought, hmm, you know, that's a big crowd. Maybe I'll walk out on the field and get, you know, a little applause, a little love. <laughs> I remember doing it, you know, so I got my yeah. shoulder pads and my, under my arm and I'm walking, you know, up the sidelines and I'm getting all this applause. So I was feeling pretty good about stuff. And I remember Danny Ross, the great Danny Ross. The late great, yeah. He was, yeah, he was my roommate. And he came up and said, do not let them talk you into going back in and playing. Because, you know, Forrest hated the Browns. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and we had a chance to knock them out of the playoffs. So, anyway, after about 10 minutes, he turns, Forrest comes up to me and says, hey, can you punt? <laughs> That, that, that's not hard. Can you punt? So I said, sure. I, so I went in and punted. But you had been knocked out and, cold, right? I mean, you were unconscious yeah, for a good, good for period 20 of time. Minutes. Yeah, like, 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I mean, can you imagine a boxer being knocked out, coming back and fighting a new opponent? <laughs> like, in, in, so anyway. in today's football, are you kidding me? Concussion oh, protocol, yeah. <laughs> right? Oh, like, yeah. That was, that was... So, okay. So anyway, so, so I come go back, back to punt. Yeah. yeah. And they rough me, Dave. Yeah, I get roughed by Cleveland, knocked it right on my head. They flip me on my head, and uh, so then we. But the half ends, and we go in. And I remember, and Kenny was saying, you know, don't let him talk you into playing. You know, right. don't let him talk you into. So all my friends were warning me. Well, as we're going out the door, Forrest says, "Hey, can you play receiver? <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine?" And uh, and again, in the back of my mind, because my brain was still working a little, I was thinking, oh, man, this has got to help me for contract. (laughs) This has got to help. So I said, sure, I'll play. And I go out there, and, um, you know, the the true story is we were running a sweep to the right, and I was the wide receiver on the left, and I saw Darden. And I never tried to hurt anyone in, in my life, but he's running across the field and I clipped him, man. I mean, I went for it. I knocked, I got his knees I, and he's screaming at the ref. Yeah. And, and I'm and serious. The ref under his breath as I'm going back to the huddle says, that was your one. The ref let you get even, huh? That was your one, one, one time. Well, he tried to kill me. Yeah. No question. <laughs> no question. Unbelievable. Yeah. So, 
Yeah. So the um, and then I remember we were in the huddle. You you probably didn't notice it because you were actually playing football. <laughs> but so we had that little under route. That's where I got knocked out. You know where they clear yep. deep, and I went a little five yard in. Right. And uh, Kenny called it. And I said no. <laughs> I'm not running that pattern again. And so they called something different. Then later, uh, Infante got together with Kenny, and they renamed it and tried to trick me. (laughs) (laughs) But I said, no way. I would not run it. So it was pretty funny. It was funny. Yeah. So and then we, yeah, Jack, actually, it was it was Kenny. It was Jack. Yeah. Kenny was not playing. It was Jack Jack Thompson. Thompson. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And you made an unbelievable so, catch. I mean, just rolling over the body of a defender, making a diving catch for a touchdown. I mean, it wasn't any, you know, it wasn't any just uh, routine play. It was a hell of a play you made. <laughs> you know, what's really weird about that is because I, I know people can't understand or relate to how everything slows down. And I remember catching that ball that was behind, behind my hip. I didn't see the ball. It literally hit my hands. And I'm thinking, I can't believe it's stuck. Wow! I'm in the middle of the catch, but that you know how it slows down. That's exactly what I was thinking. That I can't believe it's stuck. And then I bounced off that guy twice into the end zone. I can't believe they gave it to me, but it was a touchdown. But it they was. didn't call it. Yeah, yeah, it was. So and then the, you know you couldn't have a, a better game to have a good game. But this is the end of the story. So. Now I go, I, you know, do a lot of interviews, and it was and Brian Gumble was covering that game. Mm-hmm. It was a big deal, uh, and I go out, and, and uh, <laughs> there's only a couple cars left in the parking lot, and one of them's Mike Brown, and he's at his car, <laughs> and Mike looks at me and says, uh, "Don't think that's going to help your contract <laughs> negotiation. <laughs> You're talking about backfiring." <laughs> so I promise right. you. <laughs> so. It was fun. That's classic. That is classic. <laughs> so while you're playing football, I mean, you're a guy that is always, uh, always looking for opportunities, creating opportunities, taking, uh, taking advantage of situations that may present themselves and, and starting lineup, the action figures that you started in 1986, uh, that you sell to Kenner and, uh, later Hasbro buys Kenner, but $700 million in sales, of the starting lineup. Tell us, take us through that entire creative process of the fertile mind of Pat McAnally. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was, again, I was trying to take advantage of a situation. I was lucky. A guy named Bruce Stein had been hired by uh, Kenner. They stole him from uh, Mattel out uh-huh. here on the West coast. Cause he was a brilliant guy and they wanted him to come in and create new toys, new ideas, and, and, you know, spark the company. So it just so happened that, thank goodness, uh, Leslie's father sold my condo, which, by the way, was up the cloister that had been Johnny Bench's condo many years before. <laughs> so it was a pretty neat unit. Anyway, um, so I'm just – so I'm meeting with him before we go back to California, and I'm trying to get rid of my furniture, Dave. <laughs> I'm thinking I don't want this dentist cabinet. <laughs> all these antiques. So maybe this guy will buy some of them, right? So we get to talking, and he says, well, you know, what do you do? And I said, well, I write this article, you know, that's in 125 papers for parents of young athletes. And his eyes lit up, and he said, oh, man, you know, families and kids, and you need to make up a toy idea for me. Hmm. That, I mean, that's really how it started. Wow. And he, by the way, he did end up buying a lot of furniture, which was I was very grateful for. Well, anyway, um, so I come up, so I waited a couple of days, and then before we left, I said, I met with him, and I came up with this concept of dino world. And uh, so it's going to be, you know, you build dinosaurs, like a puzzle. Hmm. And uh, so he looked at me, and, he, and, I, and he, he said, that is so bad, an idea. I mean, no, I, how many concussions did you have? He really said that to me. <laughs> said look at i I gotta take you to a toy store and he did in northern kentucky he takes me to a toy store and i'm walking around and up and down the aisles explaining toys to me and i i see bazooka uh you know gi joe and i see this one called uh, bazooka bill or something and they have this you know whole like biography of bazooka bill's primary job is carrying that weapon but he also carries extra ammunition and 
And I'm thinking, I swear, in my head, I'm thinking, well, everybody already knows who Walter Payton is. Right. Well, you don't have to create him. Let's yep. just make a three-dimensional baseball card, football card. That's, but I didn't tell Bruce that. I, so I just left for California, and then I said, I got an idea. But I don't, want, I don't want you yelling at me again, so let me go meet with Kenner. And so they have they set an appointment for me, only because of the Bengals, you know. They had, like, their top 20 people in sales and in creativity and everything, marketing, in the room. And um, on the way over, <laughs> I spent, like, uh, $2 on baseball cards. This is all the props I had. And then I took one of his um, Star Wars figures. Huh. Because they were big into that Kenner, sure. and he gave that to me free, so I invested a full two dollars, and um, so they gave me twenty minutes to present. And I left like two and a half hours later. Wow! And uh, yeah, it was you amazing. had them, and you of course, had yeah, within like twenty minutes, they're all saying, "How could we not have thought of this? This is so simple." But anyway, so then I go back to the uh, Netherlands Hilton, and. I get a call like about 20 minutes later and they're downstairs with a check to hold the idea wow. for a week, for a week. That's a true story. And then, so then I fly with Bruce uh, to New York on Monday, the following Monday. And I got, so get this, Dave, this is, I was, I'm so lucky and I like, but this is really luck. So we go to the uh, NFL and we get the licensing deal. Well, li li on Monday, John Flood was a teammate and and backfield mate of my fullback at Harvard <laughs> football team. He's the legal counsel. Oh, no. Yeah, so he protected me because it's hard to protect an idea like that. Right. The next day we go to Major League Baseball, and the legal counsel is Ed Durso, who was also a running back at Harvard in my class. Wow. Can you believe that? So well, the, both, two, the football and baseball, both of their attorneys are Harvard grads. Yes. Wow. And classmates in backfield. Unbelievable. They played on the football team. Well, yeah. And, uh, yeah, so, uh, so, and we got preferred uh, royalty rates, you know, from them. And, which, and then we got basketball uh, on Wednesday. So we got all three of them, uh, the licensing, in, in three days. And, um but then it took like six months to get the uh, unions. <laughs> right. That right. wasn't so fun, but we got it done. It's so incredible. That, that's the true story of what happened. So it was, it was the, the, the three dimensional figurine plus an autograph card with it. Correct. Wasn't that the deal? Yes. And that, that's my collectible, you know, cause I've collected for a long time and I, I thought it would be interesting to have, you know, to have these things signed and there is a tremendous premium. It's still a huge, um, collector base of, of starting lineup um and the really cool thing was they started having like the olympics they would limit it to five four or five cities in the country like pittsburgh and dallas and they would vie for it and then you'd um you know, they'd have a starting lineup convention for three days and it was like star wars it was crazy and uh, that was my one moment to be like uh, michael jordan i had one day where they they did a special figure of me um in Cincinnati, the convention, and they were lined up around the block a couple of times around the, the building, a whole block, and I signed autographs for like eight hours. Didn't go to the bathroom, man. That's crazy. I remember, I remember that one. That's crazy. I didn't sign too well, I don't think. I was in pain. But, uh, those, yeah, so it was, it was really fun. Those collectors, they're, they're called the SLUs, right, the SLUs? Uh-huh, yeah. Right? The guys that collected yeah. all those starting lineup figurines? That's incredible. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they invented all these boxes on how to, you know, protect them. There's a whole cottage industry. I'm telling you, there were like three or four hundred dealers at the convention. Unreal. It was really neat. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. All right. So then also, uh, as you're while you're a player, you decide you're gonna write a, a column on behalf of uh uh kids, <clears throat> really, basically. You're write a newspaper column that's nationally syndicated, Pat Answers for Kids. And I mean it's Cincinnati, Chicago Tribune, Boston Globe. How many newspapers syndicated that column? One to, uh, I think I got 125 plus, some in Canada. But I got the first, the key was I got the first 35 myself, and they were all the really big ones. I mean, wow. I used to go from practice 
and I'd go to the uh, Inquirer building and I'd make calls. And when we ever had a, a like a preseason game, I know it got I never missed when I got the sports editors live. You know, so we were playing Cleveland. Uh, and it was a Monday night game or uh, a preseason game. I can't remember. But whenever there's a preseason game, you know, I went and got those cities. So I ended up with 35 of those. And I remember, and again, it was little well, Kenny and Chris cornered me one day and said, you know, how much are you getting for, you know, to write this column? <laughs> and I said, $50, right? Because that's what the Inquirer was paying me. $50. He said, how can you waste your time doing something for $50? I said, because I think I'm going to get in 100 papers. And I'll take a hundred times fifty. Right. You know, I remember right. thinking that. And sure enough, uh, then I sold it to George Blake, was the editor of the Inquirer, and yep. he set me up to meet with King Features, the really big syndicators, and they took it from there. But I was able to keep like ninety percent of what I got, what I had brought in those thirty-five papers, and then I split everything with with them, and they got another, you know, ninety. So it was great. It was fun and. Did a lot of good. I, I, I still have, you know, bushels of, of uh, letters from parents saying, you know, because, you know, the parents, you know, but the, the sad thing is, Dave, I, I don't think I did much good because there's still so many problems with parents and, and kids, you know, uh, you know yeah. those Vince Lombardi's. But, that, I mean, there are a lot of great parents, too. Um, that's that's, so, one of, that's the biggest problem with uh, youth coaching is dealing with parents, you know, there's no doubt. Yeah, it really it's is. It. Yeah. But I was lucky because, you know, I had so many doctors and orthopedists and psychologists and people, you know, that wrote me, at, you know, asking if they could help because they wanted to get the information out, but but maybe they wouldn't listen to, you know, a doctor or, you know, a psychologist, but they'd listen to a jock from right. playing for the Bengals from Harvard. So right, right. it was really gracious of them. That's what enabled me to write it. Can't, uh, can't leave this out. Children's book collector. So <laughs> are you still, you still doing that? Do you collect comic books as well? You know, I never got into comic books. <laughs> That, that was, was Kim mistake, Wood. Huh? That's a Kim Wood special there. Yeah, yeah. Strength coach of the Bengals. He was a comic book. But your children's books, I mean, is that is that still a passion? Oh, yeah, very much. Uh, you know, I kind of, um, I got in different phases. So there was a phase where I, I spent all my time trying to find books that, uh, that were owned by actual characters, like Alice. You know, I had, yep. there was a real, Alice Liddell was, the real Alice uh, that Carol used uh, as his model. And so I had her copy of Through the Looking Glass. And then I had wow. uh, Christopher Robin's copy. There was a real Christopher Robin in the Pooh books, you know. And uh, so I had his copy of Winnie the Pooh. And, and then I had, I mean, so I had, a, there were only five or six of those. I had um, Beatrix Potter's copy of, Peter Rabbit that she actually, her family made for her. Um, So, yeah. So, but, but ultimately I settled on uh, Winnie the Pooh was always my favorite. And, you know, Fleming, here's a nice spread of interest. Ian Fleming, a tremendous collection. I had uh, Live and Let Die to Sir Winston Churchill (laughs) from Fleming. Yeah. So it was pretty cool. And then Winnie the Pooh was really my, my passion. So, I still have some great, great things. Yeah. So have you uh, have you sold any of them? You, do you just collect them? Do you buy and sell? What What do you do? Now, I always have. I, I always have been a collector that sells. You know, eventually, right. and when I finish what I'm doing. So I remember I, I put the first set together of uh, Fleming Elf, thirteen, twelve, thirteen copies of titles inscribed. Uh, he didn't sign a lot of books because he was a collector himself. Um, so I built that, and, and there was only so many Winnie the Pooh books. You know, I mean, there were only right. four books. Right. So, uh, so I would sell them. Yeah, I mean, and but my the greatest thing, I had a great uh, friend and collect uh, dealer out here, and he said the thing to buy was Beatles manuscripts. So hmm. that was the, the greatest. So I had. Uh, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds and John Lennon's Hand. I mean, the, the actual real scraps of paper that they wrote these things down, you know, not not fair copies, which is just 
them writing out the lyrics. These were the actual real. So you remember Roy Firestone? Oh, sure. Yeah, he was a big guy, you know, very popular. Sure. And he was a Beatle freak, a linen freak. And I was telling him about, um, you know, I had this amazing copy. Uh, it was on the back of a Valentine to Paul McCartney. And it was the words to If I Fell. You know, if I fell in love with you, yeah. would you promise to be true? Beautiful song. Right. The earliest manuscript that's ever shown up, and I happen to have it. So he said, oh, you got to come on my show. you got to come on my show. And I said, you cannot mention its value. You know, you cannot mention it because I have it hanging on my wall. Nobody knows what these things are worth, you know? <laughs> so so I sit, <laughs> sit down next to him on the set live, and the first thing he utters is, this is worth a couple hundred thousand. It's the, I can't believe I'm touching this. So I had to put it in a safety deposit box from then on. But yeah, that was Roy. <laughs> Unbelievable. Well, I'll tell you what, Pat McAnally, just now everybody knows why you're the most interesting man in the world, the original most interesting man in the world. You have led quite a life, my man. And you talk about a high achiever. I mean, geez, everything you do, you achieve at the highest level possible. And, uh, and what you've done for kids over the years and, and that you continue to do for kids in terms of, in, in, as well as coaching, obviously, but in terms of advice and everything that you've given to kids and parents, that stuff's, you can't put a price tag on it. So, I mean, you've lived one unbelievable life, my man. No, thanks. You know, there's one thing, though, Dave, I always want to think of, think about the team that the Bengals put together while we were there, right? Yep. Mike Brown, of course, was heading it, but, um, you know, and he was a Dartmouth undergrad in the Harvard Law School, um, you know, graduate. But think about, so they, they always try to say I was so smart. I wasn't even close to the smartest guy on our team. Think about the schools we had. Yeah. Just think about it. Well, first of all, you could have gone to Harvard, obviously, but we had Stanford with yep. Turk, yep. Cal with Isaac, Yale Penny with. was brilliant yeah Yale with Dick Duran Williams yep. Williams with uh Dartmouth Reggie Williams yeah Dartmouth. Dartmouth right and then Scott uh, Perry course, uh, Lehigh yeah Scott Perry Scott Perry was Williams, Williams think yeah. about that Steve it's Crider. amazing well, yeah I, I always so. tell people the wide receiver room <laughs> it's it's unbelievable you have <laughs> Pat McAnally Chris Collinsworth and Steve Kreider in one wide receiver room, I mean, three brilliant guys, not just great football players, have, have just dominated whatever they wanted to dominate in the business world after football. That, that, that group, you guys were splitting an atom, you know, splitting the yeah. atom in, the, in, in your wide receiver room on a daily basis. It was incredible how smart that football team was. You're right about that. The Turk and, 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 and uh, Kenny, yep. I mean, it was amazing. Yeah. Um, so... By the way, you remember when we'd have to go out on the field uh, on Mondays or Tuesdays, whenever they switched it, but we'd have the day off that you had to do your own, like, workout, you know, just sweat a little bit. And uh, yep. or, and so the, and the linemen would get to catch passes, remember? So yep. they'd do some fun stuff. Sure. You know the most brutal thing I ever had to do? No. First of all, Isaac nicknamed me T.W. <laughs> this was before Collinsworth and, and uh, Kreider were there. Uh, T.W., Token White, <laughs> that's what he always called me. So we go into that end zone. We, had the, well, we only had one end zone, remember? <laughs> really an 80-yard field. But right. We're in the end zone. One goal post. And that's a, yeah, that's a pretty big area, right? Yep. Um, and we're playing tag. <laughs> and I, I couldn't catch anybody. Isaac, Billy Brook, John McDaniel. I mean, literally, they finally had to let me touch one. And then you know what I did? I, I scrambled up the uh, upright <laughs> so they couldn't touch me again. I climbed all the way up, up the upright. But that was the most tired I've ever been. I just ran and ran and couldn't catch somebody. <laughs> so. Bunch of cat quick wideouts, man. I'm telling you. Oh, boy, were they. Oh, classic. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate uh, the time you spent and the, the reminiscing, the, the stories. I mean, they were top shelf my man really appreciate it well i've always uh you know i, I feel my health is all because of what you saved me in wilmington with uh you know the air conditioning so I'll always <laughs> be indebted to you and um again uh, those were wonderful times and um 
you're the easiest guy to talk to. I've done so many interviews through through my lifetime, and but you're my favorite. And I'm not just saying that. So just because you could beat me up, I know that. Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's the truth. And you, well, you talk about a career. You got to have somebody. I got to interview you someday. Oh yeah, you're amazing. Right. Well, all I, I have vivid memories of Wilmington College, Pat McAnally playing the guitar and just, just, uh, just, just, uh, talking brilliance, any subject, well, any time of the day. I mean, those were good times for me and great times. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Hey, can, can you send me a copy? I'd love to hear it. Definitely. Probably well, won't when I hear it. Uh, you know, but, uh, <laughs> I'll see all the errors I made. But anyway, I enjoyed it. I totally, totally enjoyed it. You're the best. Thanks, Pat. All right. All right. Bye, Dave. Thanks. Bye, Dave. Take care.